Hey, what's going on, Mike Diaz here. It's gonna be a long one. Hey, we're gonna be talking about opening up your own 3PL. We're gonna talk about that, some business things. Hey, stay tuned, but grab a seat. It's gonna be a long one. Welcome back to the channel. Mike Diaz here from LMS. Uh, we're at a different location today. I was uh, uh, took a little vacation from the warehouse to get some uh, uh, some recharge time. It's been about 10 years uh, since I took uh, some time off, so it's uh, it's been a wild ride. Uh, but the last few weeks, we've gotten so many inquiries from uh, so many great people uh, talking about how can we, you know, how. How can we start a 3PL business? Um, and uh, if you ask me, you know, we've, we've, talk, we've talked to a few folks and I didn't want to inject anything negative into them, but um, I, am, I am a realist. Ask me today to re replicate what I did 10 years ago in this market with this customer base and how advanced logistics has gotten and, and, and such the, the high demand um, of it and the price of real estate, um, the different type of customer, um, the handling requirements now for some things. It, I, I don't think I'd be able to replicate this again. Um, looking at it, you know, especially at, at the scale that I did with the budget that I did, I, I don't think I would be able to. Um, I've been saying this for quite a long time now that the 3PL industry is not for mom and pops anymore. Um, and, you know, I say that because uh, the smaller you are, uh, the more diverse you have to be customer wise. Um, your employees have to wear a lot more hats. Um, you have to wear so many hats. Uh, there's so many hurdles to, to, to get by, you know, when it comes to you know, budgetary purposes, you're, signing your lease and, and in this new market that rates are you know north 200 percent i don't know how a small warehouse can do that unless you're sitting on a really really big nest egg of you know um five to ten million dollars and even then it's gonna it's it's gonna it's gonna be hard to scale because uh, in the beginning you're on the grow right it's um i the way i the way i put it is you know what comes first the chicken or the egg um, so a lot of folks, most of the folks, 90% of the folks that talked to me said, how do I find customers? And my question, my first question was, where are you going to put them? Do you have a place? Do you have a warehouse right now? And 90% of them said no. And, um, no customer is going to want to sign with you if you don't have uh, real estate already, if you don't have a working functioning warehouse. Um, so you're going to have to fork out the hundreds of thousands. In, in a facility, and I say hundreds of thousands because you have to be at a minimum of 50,000 square feet to do anything. Uh, 50,000 square feet is not the ideal square footage that you want to be in um, in the beginning. You, you, you really have to be at least in the 100,000 square feet if you want uh, to start and be able to scale. It's a uh, it's tough because your new customer is tough. Your, your new customer, uh, they don't want to commit. They want a lot of square footage for a little bit of time because um, they're, they're mostly project-based. Um, there's a lot of foreign players out there and these guys are brutal. I will not do business with anyone that's based in China um, just because of the bad, uh, the bad you know, uh, business etiquette out there. Um, and even Chinese will tell you how bad business etiquette that Chinese have. Um, and we've gotten screwed. We're, we're, we're 0 for 4 uh, with Chinese-based customers. We've gotten screwed every single time. Um, so we don't do business with them, um, anyone based out of there. And, you know, 
it's you're doing business with people around the world and if something happens there is no way for you to recuperate pretty much anything because uh, now you got to go after them and you're gonna have to go after them in their country uh, so anyway um, on the square footage it's it's almost like you know do you get the square footage and do you you sign a couple of hundred thousand dollar lease and then you have an empty 50 hundred thousand square foot building and now you're looking for customers um, from what I have seen um, most of my peers a hundred percent of my peers that have big businesses uh, they started working for a warehousing firm and ended up taking one of their biggest customers with them and that's been the narrative that I've heard since I've started um, we when I started I purchased a a, a, a trucking company that had a warehouse that was going out of business. So uh, my first couple of months, I was trying to bring in more transportation revenue and 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 focusing more on transportation. And I found out three part of three months later that it was just a waste of time, and I immediately stopped. Sold everything that had to do transportation wise. Sold all the trucks. Sold all the equipment. Even changed out, revamped my website to be a 3PL warehousing company, and it was a success. Uh, doing that because you know here we are today you, you got to figure it out if you're going to have a building and what size facility because that size facility you're going to be married to for at least five six years and maybe even longer because you know when it's time to scale uh, what i tell folks is timing is of the essence and timing is never at your side uh, you could have you could have the best account that needs a hundred thousand square feet you have them on a hook you're ready to hook them in or reel them in and they could be under contract they could be under, you know, under a contract that's just not their time to leave. And it's, you know, now you have to wait for them for six, seven, eight months, nine months, 10 months, who knows? I've, have, I've, have, I've had to wait for customers uh, two, three, four months. So that means that empty space is not making any money. What I, what I, have, done, what I have learned is to oversell. Uh, when I oversell and I don't have enough uh, square footage for the needs that I have, um, but it ends up working out well because there's always delays uh, for when people are coming in. There's always delays with, uh, with you know, logistics side or, you know, there's an emergency that um, we needed to be here for three months. Now it needs to be two months. So at the end of the day, it really it, it works out if you know how to play Tetris at an advanced level in your warehouse. So a question I get uh, as well is how do I find customers? And the answer to this question is. Put yourself in the shoes of a customer looking for a 3PL, and you go from there. That's how I did it. Um, I said I, I just got on Google and said, and and look for you know the nearest 3PL, um, uh, um, you know third-party warehouse, third-party logistics company, fulfillment company, and then you have all these other websites that pop up that that focus on the software side of things. Um, so we've used um, uh, there's there's three resources you got. Uh, Thomas.net that you can list your warehouse on. Um, you can list it on Leonard'sGuide.com. Uh, you can also use uh, Insight Quote or WarehousingAndFulfillment.com. Uh, that'll that's like an online funnel that'll bring you leads, and then you have to fight for the leads. Um, just remember that these leads are also getting sent to a hundred other warehouses. Um, another way is um, to have good relationships with. Freight forwarders. Freight forwarders are the first ones that talk to customers when they're importing goods. And a lot of times customers are gonna ask them for uh, reputable warehouses. Um, those guys have gotten into warehousing themselves. <coughs> so, but there are still, um, so they created the 4PL industry and that's uh, those guys that have networks with other warehouses and they'll service the customer with your square footage and you're dealing with the freight forwarder, but they're dealing with the customer. Um, that's another way to find the customer. Um, trade shows is the old way, uh, but that's still a good way. Go to, go to whatever trade show you, of whatever industry you want to uh, handle, or you know if you're already in a certain industry like the hydroponics industry or the cannabis industry, or you know IT um, electronics is, is really great to handle because it's expensive. And those people pay a good amount of money uh, for your handling uh, services and your uh, your storage. 
So if you want to market those things, then you have to hit those trade shows. Um, you want to probably uh, have an ad or two in their industry um, publications. Uh, so, you know, like Popular Mechanics or uh, Guns and Ammo, you know, if you, want to, if you want to cater to those industries. If you want to cater to the automotive industries, you got to hit up SEMA. Um, you got to post in automotive magazines. That way people can find you. Um, and just never stop working wherever you go network be a vehicle that's that's where you spend the most money is networking um, you definitely want to reach out to your local warehouses um, and establish a you know line of communication someone's gonna need help someone's gonna need additional square footage um, and if you're reputable and you do things you think you do things right um, you'll have a warehouse that wants to probably get rid of a a bottom end customer but it's a customer for you that's going to fill your square footage um, you know it's better to make something on it than nothing on it um, but be careful with that as well there's uh there's there's a larger companies out there like xbo logistics ch robinson <coughs> that are doing the 4pl thing as well um, a lot of folks are trying to get away from the liability side of things even even logistics companies are trying to get out of the liability, um, and they're 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 using other folks' warehouse to service their customers. Um, CH Robinson has been really really good, uh, but you really it's a strange process to get in, and it's like uh, you can, in the beginning you're gonna you're gonna hit the hurdle of um, you don't have enough enough experience to handle you know their customer, but um, if you never get it, then you're never gonna have that experience. Um, so you, you, you just got to spend a lot of time in, in the industry and, um, you know, get your own customer of a substantial size and operation uh, so then a larger conglomerate can see you and give you the opportunity. Uh, you're going to have a lot of problems and, and a lot of hurdles in the beginning. You're too small. You don't have enough credit. You don't have enough money. It's just, you know, it, there's just challenge over challenge over challenge, uh, especially when you're going to lease your building. Uh, you have your landlords that really prefer to have, you know, big box, large customer like Costco or Home Depot. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Joe, Joe Schmo comes in and says, hey, I want to lease your space. And, you know, they ask you, well, what's your financial backing? And you say, well, I got credit cards and I got this, I got this loan and that. And, uh, you know, some guys really don't want to deal with that. But um, you got to get through those hurdles. You got to start where... Um, you know, you got, if, if you know that you want a certain amount of square footage and, and that's, you know, that's, that's your, that's your sweet spot, you got to go try to find it. You know, if you haven't talked to every single landlord out there with that square footage, you haven't done enough. Um, so just, just keep on hustling and keep on bustling. Um, business plans. Um, wow. That's, um, you know, in logistics, you can create a plan all you want. Um, but let that be a guide. Don't let it be set in stone. Um, that is, you know, that, that can get you in trouble because you might want to service an industry, but then here comes this other customer from another industry. You're not going to tell them no um, and leave a, a substantial size of square footage empty in your warehouse. You got to bring them in. In the beginning, you got to bring them all, bring them in, bring them in, fill the space in. Um, and you got to get them in. You got to get that space full. And then after your space is full, then you start being a little bit more um, um, picky with your customers. Start raising your rates to where you need to be. You got to know your cost. That's uh, rates is the most challenging thing, like what to charge. Um, and a lot of folks, have, that's, the, that's the second question on top of the customer. Uh, what should I charge? What, what, what should my rates be? Well, there's, um, you have to be in between two things. And you got to be in between the market, what your competitors are charging, and there's always a low, medium, and high rate uh, for California. You know, right now your your high is 26 bucks, your median is about 22, and your low is about 18. Um, you don't want to be in the low all the time. Um, you got to get you know some customers. You don't want to you don't want to um, you know you don't want to gouge your customers, but you know, you have to get what's right for you to be able to operate. Now, minimums, you gotta charge minimums. You gotta charge your minimums. Uh, Cause minimums are, is, is really what's gonna bridge that gap 
in between what you're supposed to be making and what you're not making. Uh, because remember, there's so many variables when it comes to storage. Uh, it's, it's what's in the building at any given time. And you got customers that want to play with your supply chain, uh, which means you know they'll try to get as much as they can out of the building before the first. And the first is usually when you get your snapshot of your monthly storage. Uh, so you know they can play with that. They can get everything out before the first, bring everything in on the 15th. So now they're paying half month storage. So you got to be really careful on how um, you price and how your customer operates because you might not be getting enough to pay for your, your, your square footage. Um, now, uh, some warehouses are, you know, they'll, they'll be of the type that they have maybe one to four clients in a 100,000 square foot building, but these customers are paying, you know, probably half of the square foot, half of the square, uh, half of the, the, the footprint of the warehouse. Very, very tough to do. Um, and if you're charging that much for storage, then you have to give them a really good uh, rate when it comes to handling and everything else. And you gotta make sure you're you know, not just breaking even, that you're making a profit too. Um, so you can play with those things. You can play with charging more for storage, charging less for handling, or vice versa. Uh, usually that happens when, uh, when you have a customer that their, their product sits a lot more. You charge them more for, for, for storage, less for handling. Uh, for a customer that brings stuff in and ships it right back out, you charge them really cheap for storage. At least, um, you know, if they're bringing in 10 containers a month, you know that you need at least room to keep open 10 containers a month. Um, I would charge about 10 containers worth of space um, as a minimum. And at least you have, at least you can keep the space open. If not, you can dance around your cross dock area and that's where you make some money. Uh, when it comes in, it goes right back out, and you charge them a little bit more for handling. Um, you make it attractive for them to come in. Uh, there's sometimes that we will uh, slash the initial storage, which is when they come in. I, it doesn't matter, you know, what time of the month they come in. It's half. Uh, it's half the month. Uh, it's half the month's rate, um, and then you get them for the whole month on the uh, on the first. Um, but rates are always going to be a pain you have to figure out your cost and uh, people is, have been the hardest thing for me uh, especially coming out the military um, then i'm a new yorker in california uh, folks in california are way different than folks in new york so i immediately come off as as a as an as an asshole um, but you know i'm just focused i got i got a mission i got something to get done so I don't sweet talk too much. I don't. I don't small talk. I, I want to just get get stuff done and get it done the right way. Um, out here, folks want to just get it done, but get it done however they get it done. Um, and there's no really sense of urgency out here either. Uh, so people have been the, the biggest challenge. And then don't expect anyone to come in and work like you. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I've been trying to make that uh, try to. Um, uh, to breed that culture of, you know, of the high quality culture. And I just get resistance all the time. Um, so learn to have no expectations. That's, you know, that, that, that definitely helps because you are. If, when you're, you know, if your expectations are not being met, you're going to be upset, you know, all the time. You're going to be irritated. And that just creates a, you know, hostile work environment. People are not going to flourish in that environment. Um, you try, try as best as you can to get those guys, that are, guys and gals that are going to stick around, but it's just not that, it's not that world that we live in anymore. People are going to last you at the, at the most three to five, maybe three years, five years max, but it's looking like two to three years nowadays, just like marriage has turned into about seven. Um, for, and you know, a lot of folks don't want a, uh, to work at a warehouse for the rest of their life. Um, some do, some like it. Uh, some dig the, uh, you know, finding things, putting things together, you know, putting things away and see what it looks like. They like that stuff. Um, it's just how their brain works, but not a lot of people like that. Um, so if you find one that you think is gonna stick around, that you see is gonna stick around for a long time and they're actually doing it, you know, they're, they're on three, four, or five years, man, uh, put some money in their pockets, keep them around. I made the mistake from starting from the bottom up uh, trying to develop a team 
of, you know, just an elite team, a little bit more elevated than what they should be. That way we can pay them more, they can stay longer, and I didn't need that many people to work. I never wanted the, you know, I, w I always wanted four guys as opposed to 10 guys that were, you know, um, not so savvy, not the sharpest tools in the shed, and then someone watching over them, like babysitting, a real expensive babysitter. Um, but that's where I'm at today. Um, I resisted that for the past 10 years, and that's where we're at today. We have the 10, we're at the 10 guys with the one expensive babysitter. Look, a manager is not gonna stick around working for a long time, and that's what you need, right? Uh, to get the elite guys. Uh, managers are gonna stick around when they have other people working for them. Um, and then don't expect that manager to manage like you. They don't have, uh, a lot of folks don't have cost in mind. Um, have, have your processes, uh, make sure your processes work. And then a thing that a lot, of, a lot of companies don't have is, so companies have processes and procedures, um, but they don't have management processes and management procedures. You gotta create these things because there's a way to manage your facility. There's a way to manage your building. If you bring a manager in, they're gonna do their own thing. They're gonna do things that they learned from another place and it's not gonna work for you. So create your management processes. Amazon has them. Amazon's got a, a great book called The Amazon Way. Check it out. Um, definitely read, read, read. Um, there's a, a World Class Material Handling is a great book if um, you want to uh, kind of hone your skills on warehousing and material handling and distribution. So people, people are gonna be tough. Uh, you, gotta, you gotta be competitive. You gotta see what other warehouses are charging and you gotta be in that, in that range as well. Um, and you gotta be informed. Rates go up and down depending on the pool of work, the workforce. Um, and then uh, vet your customers. Vet them, check their credit. Uh, see who they are, get references. If they're leaving a 3PL, try to find out who that 3PL is, contact that 3PL and see what, see what you're getting into. And uh, most of your customers are gonna come from that, uh, that they're leaving other 3PLs, they're having issues with 3PLs. And if you ask me, uh, most of the problems belong to the customer, right? Because uh, they don't know what they're getting into. Um, we, the 3PLs, public warehouses are not here to cater to their operation. Although a lot of warehouses say, we do things your way, we cater to your operation. That's not how it goes. You, it's, 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 you, you almost have to be like an Amazon. You create a global system and you use every customer within that system. If you don't do that, it's gonna be chaos in the warehouse. Imagine trying to teach, you, your, your workforce already is in and out. Imagine trying to teach every single one of your employees about every single one of your customers when there's no continuity once that once you lose that person you got to train the next one and the next one and the next one imagine if you're in your warehouse <coughs> and every single customer sends you a different document and then they got different vendors so it's a different document per vendor on what they're bringing in your csrs they're i'm sorry but they're not that savvy right they got to be told exactly what to do exactly what to look at just like your warehouse people, let's be real. So you need a really good office manager and warehouse manager that can interpret those things. But imagine you're getting, you got 20 different customers and you're receiving 40 different documents. They're all different. A lot of times they're buying stuff remotely. So you got a customer in Texas buying some from China. It comes to your warehouse. They had no control on the labeling. So now they call this item this and the boxes say that. It's gonna be ridiculous. A lot of them don't come in with barcodes because they don't want to pay for the they the the, the they don't want to pay for the um, UPC. It's um, it's a disaster. And then um, and then when it comes to uh, the outbound, when it comes to them selling stuff, they're selling stuff on Shopify, Amazon, Walmart, business to business, business to customer, and you're getting 20 different documents per customer. And then. If you don't have a workflow in the warehouse, you're getting documents all day. So you're back and forth and back and forth to pick locations when you could just batch everything, have your customer send you all your orders at the same time, go to that one location once, pick your 100 items, you're on your way, 
and you solve something in 20 minutes as opposed to 200 minutes because they send you 200 orders for you know um, for individual items so you got to be careful vet your vet your customers don't give anybody a job to help them out i've made that mistake and every entrepreneur will tell you that do not give anyone a job to help them out <coughs> it has never worked for me um start start tough and let loose as opposed to starting loose and tightening up uh, especially with your employees do it with your customers and your employees um i would say if you're starting out start with immediate family because no one's going to care like you do no one's going to care like your kid does like your brother does your sister whoever eight out of ten that reached out to me were women about opening up their own 3pls not surprised at all because women are are killing it nowadays against guys um, but any guys that open up their 3pls um, it's you know great to involve your better half it's it's hard it's very tough strenuous on the relationship but at least you have a successful business uh, you know handle operations while she handles finances because handling both that is a major pain in the butt. Um, but if you have somebody random handling your finances, that's not good. Like, you know, they're just worried about getting something paid or they're just worried about getting paid for something. So, you know, if something needs to get paid, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it was yours or not, whether you consumed it or not, it might be a wrong invoice. That happens a lot. It happens a lot. And I've seen it in other companies. They'll just pay for it because it gotta get done, right? Um, but they don't validate it. So you, you gotta be careful, man, when it comes to your money, uh, when it comes to finances. Uh, remember, you can be in the green overall when it comes to you know, uh, profit and loss, but cash flow, cash flow is huge. And, and, and that for three pills is a nightmare. All your customers wanna be net 90, net 60, net 30. There's customers out there, big box retailers that wanna be net 365 that is a no-go it's a complete no-go you are an extension of your customers they have to pay payroll they have to pay rent utilities net zero so they should be paying you as close to net zero as possible we're at net 10 and the majority of the guys take net 30 to pay anyway um, we do not play with that if you go into if I got a customer that's 45 days aging on something uh, we're reaching out and we're letting them know that day 60, I'm shutting down your supply chain. And if it's not their first time, I'll shut them down day 45. Uh, we've lost customers before uh, because of that, but I'm not. That's something I don't waver. You're gonna pay your bill, and you know don't. I've gotten I've gotten screwed four times already, and you know we were very lenient those times, and the you know the largest sum was three hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars, and there's no reason why you're in business to lose that amount of money if you're doing things right. Uh, especially it's because somebody don't wanna pay you. Screw that, get paid. Um, so don't be lenient with that. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of factors to opening up your own 3PL. And yeah, I probably mentioned more negative than, than, than positive, but um, you know, what, what are the positives if you ask me? Is it worth it? Um, someone that's not in in my in, in in my shoes would say oh yeah it's worth it mike you drive a lambo you got beautiful house and you know um look i'm able to take a week off and not go to work like danny says i'm a camera guy but i've been busting my ass ridiculously for the past 10 years <coughs> the first four years <clears throat> was 18 to 20 hour days and i didn't pay myself for the first three and i lived in the warehouse for the first year um and just the amount of work, the amount of stress. And when you're on the grow, you're never making money. You're just growing. And, you know, so your problems get bigger. You're, you get more employees. There's more issues, more personality issues, uh, more family problems. Everybody's got a problem. Your problems don't matter. Um, so on the grow, it's a pain in the butt. Uh, once you get to that sweet spot, if you want to coast, so right now um, I am taking out the time to start working out again. I'm getting my health back in check because um, I'm, you know, I'm 42 years old now. I started when I was 30, 
32 turning 33 um i'm not getting any i'm not i'm not a spring chicken anymore uh so just like warren buffett says you only get one body uh so take care of it um and i you know i i i put the warehouse and i put everything else um in front of me um so like now is the time for me to get that back um some people don't get that time some people because it, it feels like you know I'm, i was at the gym earlier and I was just like text after text after phone call, phone call, text, phone call. It's like, you know, I, I would answer four texts and one phone call in between sets. It's crazy. And then one of those text messages was Danny saying, hey, we got a film today. And I, I was like, oh, man, I forgot we were filming today. Uh, so we next we were filming at the warehouse and we're filming this today. Um, and it's, it's good because I just got that barrage of emails and phone calls of uh, you folks asking if you want to start a 3PL, of, you know, um, advice on starting a 3PL. So um, I think I covered, I covered, you know, the biggest points, which is your facility, your customer, and your employee. Um, those are going to be, those are major issues. And then yourself, you know, you better, you better be an expert at this. And how do you become an expert? is by, you know, learning the entire supply chain. Learn how the engine works from start to finish, from the manufacturing process, or even, even before that, the process of going to the trade show to find a manufacturer on how a manufacturer works, on how they get raw materials, turn it into finished product, Get that finished product into a shippable condition, bringing it to the U.S., the customs process, duties and all that good stuff. And then the process of bringing it to the warehouse, getting it to the customer, either to the big box or the business to the business, to either Walmart, Amazon, or to the end customer on the last mile. So learn everything about the entire chain. <coughs> you got to. Don't waver. And then when you learn it, look at it even more. Read about it. There's logistics studies that come out every year. Read them. Study them. Network. Talk to other people. Talk to other people in, in the retail business that are buyers. Talk to freight forwarders. Talk to carriers. Even the trucker that shows up to your warehouse, you can talk to him and he can teach you something. Talk to other warehouse owners. Um, you got to 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 achieve mastery in your industry that way nobody can tell you anything. Um, and then uh, there's a there's a good book called Warehousing Law. Check that out. I learned a lot when it came to that about writing contracts and what uh, contracts need to say. Um, that, that was that, that was that was pivotal. Um, and then you know in the beginning I would probably get find a a, a good uh, a a good consultant. Um, these guys have, you know, if anything, they have a lot of wisdom and they can tell you a lot about customers and problems that, that you'll have. Um, and they might bring you business as well because, uh, customers that need to purchase our services, hire these consultants to find you. Um, so that's another avenue on how do you get customers as well. Um, but I, I do recommend in the beginning stages, hire a consultant, um, but do do your due diligence on that consultant. <coughs> There's some out there that that um, I, I I I talked to a really good one in the beginning, but he was really loosey goosey, um, not not my type. And then, but I did learn a lot from him. And then I hired another guy, a VP of a huge uh, warehousing company out here in Southern California. He was great. Uh, we went over the entire book of warehousing law, um, and then uh, we did we did talk about how to gather rates and all that stuff. And I've, had, I've worked with about three consultants already and they've taught me a lot. Everyone has taught me something different. Um, so uh, I, hope, um, I hope with some of the information from today uh, gives you something to move forward with um, before you embark. If you're a small, you know, small conglomerate, if you're, if you're just a small individual, um, that doesn't have much money that wants to start out of their garage i don't recommend it um i would i would i do recommend that any of you guys if you guys have patience 
go work for a warehouse, go work for a 3 p.m. and see what it's really like. Um, and when I say, you know, you should be uh, somewhat educated and, and somewhat experienced already if you're thinking about going into 3PL and into the 3PL industry. See if you can start at the uh, account manager level, if that, um, if not, maybe the uh, the warehouse management or ops management or VP level sales. Um, that way you can really see what goes on on a daily basis and how chaos is managed. Um, get really smart on recruiting and, and, and talking to people, listening to people, because um, those are the guys that are going to set you up for success. Um, but uh, I, uh, I don't want to give anybody, you know, that negative outlook, but, you know, just like I said, I would not rep be able to replicate today what I did 10 years ago. It's just not that market. <coughs> Things are so expensive. Employees are so expensive. When I start, my, my first facility cost me $12,500 a month. Now we're almost at $100,000 a month. Um, my first employee cost me $12 an hour. My cheapest one is $23 an hour right now. Um, so it's, it's night and day difference. Um, and then you're, the customer then, yeah, they were used to paying a cheaper rate, but they had so much more loyalty. They were with you and you had every bit of their business. You had, you know, from bringing containers in from the ports to the last mile to their customer and everything in between. Nowadays, you know, you have maybe one or two things and there's so many different people involved because they got quotes from so many different people. Um, and it used to be more the customer straight to the warehouse. Now it's, you know, the warehouse with someone else. There's a lot of middle, middle people. Um, so it's, it's very different nowadays. Um, so, uh, you know, my thing to you is, is best of luck. Do your due diligence. Um, see if you can take, you know, the stressors. Uh, make sure you have enough money. Make sure you have enough, um, you know, capital put away for a rainy day because there are going to be some nasty days. Uh, for, uh, for one year, I think it was uh, 2021, we were losing $40,000 a month. It was right after COVID. We made some changes. We were losing 36 to 40 grand a month for about eight months. Um, that was ridiculous. <coughs> that might put some people down. Uh, my, first, my first bump in the road, I was a lawsuit when I first started. Um, and then my second one was an Asian customer that shut, they just stopped answering. They shut down, went back to China, and I had over $2 million of their, of their inventory in the warehouse, which was, it was garbage anyway, it was, it was furniture, but I didn't have full sets. I just look at things, every warehouse looks at things by SKUs. They had some crap in four different warehouses and then mine. Um, and then that was actually a mentor that I had uh, it was one of his customers and he screwed me over. Uh, so I got screwed over by a mentor. Um, that's why I never had mentors again. Um, so it's, uh, you, you're going you're gonna to live through so much, but you're going to learn so much. Um, and no one can take that away. That part, no one can take away as much as you're going to learn. Um, and if you can get through this, you can get through a lot more other things. Um, so if... Uh, if there's something else that you guys want to know, uh, just hit me up in the email again. Uh, throw a comment below. Um, again, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, if you embark on the journey, you can holler at me anytime. I soon I'll be charging you for these calls, though. Uh, <laughs> I'll be your, your consultant here pretty soon. Um, but until that happens, for now, it's free 99. So send the emails. Send the questions, it makes me better. And uh, look forward to uh, either working with you uh, in the future. You may have some space that I need. Uh, you may be able, to, be able to service a customer that I need to service. Um, and uh, you guys uh, be safe, take care. And um, until then, we'll see you. Mike out.